And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's trying that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. It is Friday and welcome to Climate Change Roundtable number 68 in the series. Today, we're going to be talking about the man. Yes, indeed. Michael Mann and his famous hockey stick and some other things. Wildfires and lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Anyway, we're going to talk about that. We've also got a bit of climate potpourri of news of the week that we're going to shred. And with us today are a bit of a switch up. We have uh, Andy Singer, who's normally our producer in the background. Yeah. He's with us today. Hi, Andy. What's up, Anthony? Glad to be back on the show for the first time in a long time. Uh, it's two days in a row I've been on Heartland programs. I'm getting back on camera a little bit, but yeah, uh, glad to be back. Right. Yeah, and of course, Linnea, the always reliable Linnea, who's with us today. And um, the reason is that Andy's with us today is that Sterling Burnett is off on vacation, and he's uh, taking a fossil fueled trip through Europe. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Sounds like a good time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we're going to open up with the climate news of the week and look at some of the items that have been making the rounds this week. Some of them disgusting, some of them absurd, some of them obscene. Okay, so the first one is, is that climate activist Greta Thunberg deletes tweet predicting the end of the world next week. We're all supposed to be dead right now, you know, according to this tweet that she put out. Or, you know, she's a climate expert because she skipped school and protested. That makes her an instant climate expert, right? And in, in the eyes of the It would be easy left. for me to switch careers then. I skipped plenty. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the tweet right here. A top climate scientist is warning that climate change will wipe out all of humanity unless we stop using fossil fuels over the next five years. This was sent in June of 2018. And, of course, yeah, I mean, well, we're still here. Are we? Yes. <laughs> How do we know? We could be in the matrix right now. I mean, a yeah, exactly. does. We're just an AI it. figment of your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yesterday I kind of was, but uh, yeah, I mean, what is she going to do at this point? Like, if she's just going to throw these things out there, eventually these, these dates are going to come. And unlike the past where you could just make like claims and then someone might not have the newspaper on hand that's where your claim was held, like it's all online. So you don't really have much you can do other than click delete. Fortunately, there's there's a web archive so we can look these kinds of things up. Well, Andy, you know, the internet is forever, <laughs> but it doesn't really matter if the mainstream media doesn't hold you to the fire on it, right? True. Like if they True. if they just ignore it and they say, oh, whatever, like they do with all the other climate predictions or all the other doomsday predictions, they hype it, hype it, hype it until it's clear that it's not going to happen. And then they drop it and hype the next one. Yep, that's pretty much it. They never hold anyone accountable. As long as they're pro-climate change, they're never held accountable. But, you know, let someone who's on the other side of the aisle slip up once, and they never let you forget it because, you know, <laughs> evil deniers and all that stuff, you know, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't have, I, you know, actually, I do have one quick question for you guys. How much longer do you think Greta stays in the spotlight now that she's, like, graduated high school? Because like no one cares about a kid who skips college classes. Everyone, everyone skips college classes. But but a high school kid skipping like that's 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 they're young. They're they're cute. I my prediction is one year tops. Like this is Greta's kind of done at this point. I still yeah. I think it's worth covering, but I, I don't think she's going to be huge news much longer. <laughs> she's past the point of being cute and novel at this point. Yeah, seriously. Well, until she yeah. runs for office. Yeah. In Sweden or whatever. I don't know how that <laughs> works over there, but uh, that's probably going to happen. But until then, eh, you know, that, they might trot her out on the news every once in a while to be a, a, a 
guest expert, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, yeah, Andy, I'm, I'm sure you're yeah. right. I think a, a, a Fetterman Greta ticket would be great. Yeah, a Fetterman Greta. Oh, yeah. Can you see those two next to each other? Uh, that would be brutal. Uh, that how dare you speech would be a lot scarier if I knew that person had, uh, you know, government power over me. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I was curious. All right. So let's go on to the next topic. Now, this one here, this one made me laugh because, you know, I, I've been on television and radio for 35 plus years, and I've had all kinds of horrible things said about me. You know, you ruined my golf game. You know, you, 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 your forecast was wrong, whatever. So this guy, this guy goes out and starts pushing climate change on his regular daily weather forecast, trying to educate people about climate change, right? And he's getting blowback constantly. Well, what he doesn't understand, obviously, is that, you know, about half of your audience doesn't want to be lectured to, maybe more than half of your audience, you know, and the other half of the audience doesn't really see this as relevant. People just want to know, what's the weather tomorrow? How do I dress? How do I plan my day? They don't want to be lectured to about climate change. And he's complaining because he's getting mean emails and mean tweets and things like that. And oh, no, it's terrible. It's distressing. So he's got PTSD, so he has to resign. Well, yeah. buck up, buddy. I mean, seriously, if you're not, if you're on television and you don't have a thick skin, you need to be in another business. And that's essentially what he's done. He's basically said, I'm out of here. I can't handle the stress because of, you know, people yeah. are mean to me because I talk about climate change. I mean, if you're if you're going up on television, and especially if you're saying something that's highly political and you know is highly political, you can't then just you know cry like oh I this was unexpected and like un, un like no you're 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 inviting controversy onto yourself at that point and I, yeah I, I don't really have much kind of sympathy for that person I pulled the tweets up here just because it's kind of interesting uh, they're not even bad it's not it's not like like they're they're just kind of like annoyed with the person it's not like they're they're unless I'm missing something they're overtly violent like you get what it, I'm going it at it appears to be all from the same person. Like these aren't different people emailing him. These are all from the same person. They so have one person. If you know, it's not as if the Heartland Institute or any one of us doesn't have a favorite occasional emailer who sends us some really nice stuff. Like if I you're like in the this. public sphere, it's too bad. You're gonna deal with this stuff. Yeah, um, yeah I agree you with know, that. I got some nice comments on some videos <laughs> previously. Everyone does. If you're if you're in the public eye, you are going to get hate mail and some of it is going to be threatening. It's up to you to practice some prudence and to determine whether or not the threats are real threats that you need to take action on, which is sometimes the case, um, versus threats that are just empty nonsense. Uh, but if you get your, you know, all twisted up over someone calling you an idiot in your email. Yeah. You're not going to make it in in public <laughs> in public life. It's just not going to happen for you, bud. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just amazed about this, you know. And I learned a long time ago. Even though I, you know, know a lot about climate and I want to talk about it. When I give a weather forecast, whether it's on radio or whether it's on television. I do not try to lecture to people trying to get them to look at this viewpoint that I have. That's saved for you know documentaries or special features or other things. But in the daily weather forecast, people don't want to be lectured to about climate change. They just want to know what the weather is for tomorrow and next week so they can plan their day and their week and weekend. That's it. If you start doing anything else, well, then you deserve everything that's being thrown at you. Well, and Anthony, isn't it true? Because you were in broadcast meteorology uh, for a while. Isn't it true that you have a limited amount of time to deliver your presentation anyway? So isn't that's he true. wasting time that he can talk about the weather by talk trying to connect, you know, wildfire smoke to climate change or whatever it happens to be? You know, that's it's you have a finite amount of time on broadcast television. So yes, it's typically from two and a half to three and a half minutes. Sometimes it's longer if you have to do fill in or whatever because you know they've lost a story or a tape machine jammed or something like that. But uh, typically it's two and a half to three and a half minutes in most uh, television markets. And you don't have time to start, you know, 
waxing prophetically about things unless you're asked to fill time. But he's been he was making climate change a regular feature apparently, and that was just basically ticking off a lot of his viewers. Yeah, and rightly so. You know, one quick thing uh, we have a comment here just about the Greta thing. I thought we may as well just you know bring it up quick. Is uh, it, it's saying that Greta was saying that if we didn't stop using fossil fuel, fossil fuels by a certain year, we'd be doomed. Uh, so I think the way this actually was is Greta tweeted that the world would be doomed by by today or a week from today or whatever it's going to be. And then she was uh, quoting some article by a Harvard scientist. And he said that it was misrepresented. And he was saying that this was the date where if we didn't change, the world would end. But but Greta's well, actually to be fair, that's that probably we, true. But the yeah. fact of the matter is that she took that belief yeah, correct. and ran with it. And oh, that's, no, that's on her. Saying. Yeah, yeah. And it Greta was two days ago. It was two end. days ago. You're supposed uh, to be two days before the day after tomorrow or so. oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah right yeah uh no the he's right that the original scientist was a little bit more moderate in their but claim not Greta. there Greta was great yeah yeah but not by much you know it's this it's the tipping point thing right they're saying we have until yeah. this date if we don't stop using fossil fuels and stop using fossil fuels i mean not you know wean ourselves off of it but stop by That's this awesome. time, then there will be no coming back. We'll have runaway warming, whatever it happens to be. Those kinds of claims are made all the time. All they do is they push the timeline forward every time that it doesn't come to fruition. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So let's go on to the next topic here. We have, oh, yes, the Hollywood Climate Summit. You know, because it's really important to get the opinion of movie stars about climate change because they're just as much as experts as great of, right? You know, so they're having a climate summit. Yeah. And we don't know what's um, what's going to come out of this other than maybe grand pronunciations like we have to stop using fossil fuels now. The end of the world is nigh. Or, yeah. What else could they say? <laughs> I this mean, is we'll actually some cool parties to me could... the worst possible thing that they could do to try and get people to their side. I I I really I bet that the actual scientists who are um you know somewhat alarmist hate some of this stuff because you have some of the people with the most lavish overconsumption <laughs> lifestyles. <laughs> anyone in the entire world and they're going to sit there and they're going to say that we're not doing enough yeah i mean right. no one, no one hates getting preached at by watch. someone no one likes it and one of the points that um jane fonda made was that there isn't enough climate change content in the movies we just had like a movie come out last year that was just about climate change. We just had a movie come out that was about sabotaging a pipeline in order to protest climate change. Yeah. We just had, you know, I was watching um, The Last of Us, which is a zombie TV show. Uh, finally got around to watching it, Andy. Um, <laughs> and I did like it. But I, you know, they always, they had... I think a couple times where they just kind of in casual conversation drop in that you know, if, if the planet wasn't killed by, um, you know, zombies, then it was going to be killed by climate change. You know, like they just they can't help themselves. There's another movie, um, Cloverfield Paradox, that really the point of the movie is this science fiction space rift concept. Mm -hmm. But what they what they do with it is they set it up in the reason why we're in space trying to generate this infinite energy source or whatever is because we're destroying the planet with climate change um uh, or with our you know movie, fossil fuel <laughs> it's they all have little climate change things slipped into them either in casual conversation between characters or as a base part of the story so what are they talking about that they don't have enough climate content in film and <laughs> tv yeah seriously so yeah, day one, we're all in. You should be excited about the Hollywood climate movement, you oh know? God. Gosh. <laughs> if you guys like good I... stories, we've got climate. <laughs> yeah, Hollywood's time to take on big oil and gas. Yes, well, I'm, I'm all for that. If you guys want to get rid of your Mercedes and your Maseratis, go this, for it, you know? This one's bad. Reframing our way of being, which just translates to living with less. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't see what else. They, why else you'd word it that way? If if you're gonna live with more, you're not gonna say reframe. You're gonna say like, hey, let's have a better life. Like, <laughs> um, right? Crazy. Yeah. So, 
Rescripting unscripted TV, the climate <laughs> reality. What the hell is that? Crazy. <laughs> I'm sure they're all ridiculous. We got three days of this. I, I'm intrigued, but they could probably just go on forever. Um, I'm sure we'll have some good content out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I can't wait to see what pronouncements come out of this. You know, uh, we've had Jane Fonda say things like, you know, uh, climate deniers should be put in jail and so forth in the past. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure next week we'll have all kinds of really, really hard news coming out of that mess. It's just ugh, what do you think? Mm-hmm. All right. So NASA had decided, NASA decided this week, we're going to get in on the extra stupid things going on this week. So they came up with this simulation of Andy, if you'll scroll down a little yes. bit, there's this, there it is, this picture right here. You see this, this is earth under being, being covered with carbon dioxide. Um, and this is this came out of the NASA Visualization Studio, and they're basically saying Earth is going to turn into a gas giant like Jupiter. Ah, oh, this is stupid! It burns. First of all, carbon dioxide is transparent; it's not brown goo like you see here. And secondly, we're nowhere close to even having the mass to be able to create a ma- a gas giant like Jupiter. You can't do these things with the amount of mass available in Earth. It's simply astronomically impossible. This is why Earth was not a gas giant to begin with. I mean, the science fail here on whoever visualized this thing at NASA is extraordinary. But the bottom line is is we don't have it happening. It's not going to happen. It's impossible to happen. And yet these idiots are out there pushing this. It blows my mind. Well, I'm sure that if you push the scientists on it, they'll say, well, no, this is, we know, but this is just a visualization to show what it, you know, what the, um, since we can't see carbon dioxide, this is what it would look like, blah, 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 that kind of thing. They'd moderate it a bit, but they know that the point of an image like this is to frighten people into thinking that Earth will be uninhabitable because of carbon dioxide. Uh, But what I will say is that this graphic, you know, in terms of its usefulness in teaching people, um, about how our atmosphere works, I think it's a pretty good graphic for showing that it's not evenly mixed. That, I mean, at least that's interesting, right? Because obviously it's not evenly distributed over mm-hmm. the surface of the planet, but they don't use it for that. They use it to try and scare you into thinking that we're going to be like Jupiter or Saturn or something by by yeah. some arbitrary date. You know, uh, it's the way that they use this stuff is gross. And that's it is. pretty cool All right. at this point. It is. It's crazy. But what do you do? You know, there a lot of these people are co-opted by their belief system. Okay. Final absurdity of the week. This is a real groaner. Oh, man. This global warming will make dogs hate humans. I, 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 to be honest, I didn't have a chance to look at this before we started. So I'm kind of going into this one blind. Are they serious? <laughs> like, like, what was their seriously? Reason? Like, what? How? How did they claim? I, I'm very curious what link they yeah. here. Apparently, they're using a complex pooch model to come up with this. <laughs> come up with this. I, I don't know. Oh, it, 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 the absurdity is just off the scale with this one. I mean, uh, I mean, it, it's like okay, global warming is 1.5 degrees centigrade. Let's let's just use that, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> let's say you uh, you live in New York City, and you have a dog. And the average temperature in New York City is 58 degrees. And you fly you and your dog down to Miami. It's now 10 degrees warmer, 20 degrees warmer, whatever. Is your dog automatically going to hate you? I think not. He's going to go play in the ocean. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, like, I, like they're, they're, they're clearly just grasping. So that's insane, honestly. Just it. it if anything, your look dog's at, just going to be sleepier. Like that's look that's at that. Look at that, that though. It says dogs are eleven percent more likely to attack people on days with higher UV levels. Right, higher and that's UV not even levels. climate change. Yeah, got- that doesn't that doesn't relate to global warming. <laughs> that's just <laughs> solar activity. Maybe yeah. I don't know. Does the sun make dogs mad? I'm not sure. Are they claiming uh, the sun affects the temperature? It just goes to show you how right. incompetent yeah. journalism has become. Yeah, no, see, I, that I can agree with. <laughs> Anyway. Um, all right, should we, should, we, should we hit the main thing? Yep, I think so. All right. <laughs> I, uh, okay, so let's go on to the main features. Sticking it to the man. <laughs> oh, boy. So 
We, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did some stuff about wildfires, you know, uh, in Canada. There was wildfires in Canada and smoke enveloped New York City and turned the sky yellow. And people were seeing this as this, you know, the coming apocalypse of climate change because it couldn't be anything else, right? So we, pro we produced a couple of things about this, talking about how this was just something that's happened before. It's been in the history books. Uh, it's not an a, a indicator of climate change. The data doesn't support it. So what happens? CBC brings on Michael Mann, and he starts talking about the whole conspiracy theory and the big thing behind it, right? And you got to watch this and, and listen to some of this. So let, let's bring it up and run that clip. As unprecedented wildfires continue to spread across the country, so does false information about why. This mis misinformation has been promoted by some media outlets and even a handful of elected officials. That's despite a virtual consensus among scientists that wildfires are becoming more frequent and severe due to human-caused climate change. To learn more about the problem and how to address it, I'm joined now by Michael Mann. He's Presidential Distinguished Professor and Director of the Penn Center for Science, Sustainability and the Media. He's also the author of a recent book called The New Climate War, which spells out how fossil fuel companies have sought to delay action on the climate. We've reached him today in Bullsburg, Pennsylvania. So, Professor, welcome. Thank you so much for making some time for us. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you. It's good to be with you. Let's start here by, by talking a little bit about what we know from scientists, just how certain they are uh, that human caused climate change or climate change, pardon me, is a driver of these increasingly severe and frequent wildfires that we're seeing in various places around the world, but including here in Canada. Yeah, you know, we use fairly sophisticated climate models to make projections of uh, future climate change and the impact that climate change is having now on extreme weather events. But this one isn't hard. You don't need a sophisticated model. You take unusual heat, unusual drought, you put them together and you get more expansive wildfires, hotter burning, uh, faster spreading, more dangerous, more damaging wildfires. And we've seen that around the world. I saw that down in Australia a few years ago when I happened to be there during what they now call the Black Summer when unprecedented heat and drought combined to, to give those, those uh, devastating wildfires that blanketed the, the nation. And it's, as Yogi Berra uh, famously once said, it's deja vu all over again. Because okay, stop like the tape, stop the, the tape. All right. Danger vu all over again. Now, that's the key thing here. Michael Mann is not paying attention to history. And the, the journalists are not paying attention to history. In our article that we published up on climate realism about the wildfires, we pointed out that way back in 1790, the entire Northeast turned dark, so dark that they had to light candles. And this was because of a wildfire that happened in Canada, much like today, making so much smoke that it darkened the skies. Now, I can assure you the colonists back then were not driving SUVs. So what's the driver here? Not climate change? Well, it wasn't even a, a, a glint in anybody's eye back then. Nature, natural stuff. And this is just natural stuff that's happened. I mean, yes, we had some lightning storms that produced uh, some fires in Canada. That's not necessarily climate change. Unusual drought or unusual... Uh, heat? Well, we've only got 150 years or so of, of records about weather. So how do we know? What was the temperature like a thousand years ago? What were drought conditions like a thousand years ago? They keep talking about unprecedented things, but these are not unprecedented at all when you go back and look at history. Guys, what do you think? Uh, I think that's why they always say on record and set the record to very recent dates. <laughs> so so they don't have to compare them against uh, greater history because it won't hold up. That, that would be my quickest uh, take, Linnea. Well, I mean, we hit on him last year or, or two years ago when he was talking about the Black Summer you fires in Australia. Oh, am I muted? No, nope, sorry. I made oh. a joke. Ignore me. <laughs> um. We hit on the fact that it wasn't, there's no meaningful trend whatsoever in Australia of increasing or decreasing rainfall amounts. So you can't say that it's getting drier in the areas that he claims. Um, the IPCC doesn't have a solid trend for wildfire occurrence. When they say that there is a virtual consensus among scientists on 
uh, wildfires getting worse due to climate change that is caused by human beings. That, to me, that reads as just flat out untrue. <laughs> uh, yeah. It might even be a lie. But um, it's the data from the the organizations that they contribute their research to, like the IPCC, don't even come to that conclusion. Right. So what are they talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a belief system. That's it. Uh, yeah, and the forest fire one is pretty simple. I I don't have the charts in front of me. Maybe I'll try to find it in a second and show it on screen in a bit. But I've seen these um these images before where you can look at forests uh, forests that are like re are nationally controlled and locally controlled, and there'll just be this line, and you can see that one of them will be have the the brush cleared, be like somewhat well maintained, and one will just be a. Uh, of the opinion that caring for the environment means like just staying as far away from it as possible. And what you end up with is this, this powder keg of um, just dry timber that's waiting to burn. So it, it, no. this one is one of the more self-explanatory ones in my opinion. And just that like cleaning up dead brush in a forest might help prevent wildfires. Yeah. Agree or disagree. <laughs> like, like... All right. Let's see what the man has to say next. Now here in the eastern United States where I could smell the wildfire smoke, I could see it in my home here in the middle of Pennsylvania. Yeah, oh, even no. those fires, of course, are, are hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away from where you are in Pennsylvania. Uh, certainly something Indeed. that we've noticed in, in recent weeks on social media. Some people have been suggesting that arsonists and not climate change are to blame for these fires. We've seen uh, various satellite images that they've used that they have been spreading on social media, showing wildfires starting, saying that, you know, of course, this must be an arsonist doing this because they're all springing up at the same time. That's just some of the misinformation that we've seen recently. Talk to us a little bit about that, about what you've been noticing and, and why it could be damaging. Yeah, you know, th this massive misinformation campaign. Uh, Stop we say here Stop in the United States, tape. we see massive misinformation campaign. A bunch of disparate, di widely scattered people on social media came to some conclusions, many of them wrong. And somehow, this is a campaign. This is the same kind of idiotic belief system that they have about big oil is driving everyone to think that climate change is not a crisis. It's just absurd. Well, and you notice too, she didn't even, neither she, maybe man will in a minute here, but neither of them appear to be trying to refute or explain the images that people have cited. And maybe people are wrong when they're thinking that, you know, 10 or 15 fires springing up at the exact same time as it appears on satellite imagery. They may be incorrect that it is some coordinated arson attempt, but you can't just say they're wrong. This is misinformation and then move on and not even right. address it. There are so many it's people really who are so argument. misinformed. Then you need, it is your job then as the climate expert who goes on TV to tell them why they're wrong. And right. hopefully in a typical way so that they'll listen to you. This guy, all he wants to do is say, you know, I'm so smart. Everyone else is dumb. They're attacking me because I'm so smart. And that's it. It's nonsense. It really is. And, you know, I, if you listen to the entire interview and we don't need to do it now because, you know, we've made our points, but he doesn't go into any of the details whatsoever. He just simply says it's climate change. Shut up. I'm an expert. That's essentially his message. And um, there's nothing else. There's, he doesn't provide any supporting data, no graphs, nothing like that. Now, I want to go to back to our Heartland piece that I published a couple of weeks ago and show you some supporting graphs. Okay, so if you scroll down a little bit there, Andy, uh, you'll see some graphs down there. And one of them, one of the most important graphs had to do with Canada, right there, Canada and Quebec, okay? The trend of forest fires in all of Canada is down. The trend of forest fires in Quebec, where these particular forest fires that man was squawking about, also is down. So where's the climate change driver in this? It isn't there. Now, it's not just Quebec. It's the same thing in the United States, but I can show you data if you scroll down further about global wildfires. Now, just recently in the last 20 years or so, we've got, there it is right there. Satellites have been able to monitor fires. They've been able to monitor when fires spring up and their coverage area. And this data here, 
from NASA, NASA Earth Observatory shows that the global burned area since 2003 to 2015, and this is the only part that we have data for, more data exists, but they haven't published it. It's down. Where's the climate driver in this, Mr. Man or Dr. Man? It's not there. Your statements are nothing more than rhetoric. Yeah. I, uh, I'll be honest, I was looking at the comments for a moment there, and we just whoever gets the best wordplay with the with the name man in it in, in the comments, I'm definitely shouting out at the end of the episode. We got some good ones in here. I just wanted to point that out. Um, uh, that was it. That was all I had for the moment. The, I don't know, the wildfire thing is, is a pretty, I mean, the data is so clear on a lot of this that, you know, and a lot of time, I'm sure that what they'll say if they were to look at this global burned area uh, data is they'll say, well, we know that um, climate change is causing rainfall to increase in some areas. So that might be why. Well, then you can't run around saying that climate change is gonna cause more wildfires if you're also saying that's gonna cause us to have more rainy seasons. And they'll say, well, in some areas, the drought will get worse and that will cause more climate or more wildfires. And in other places, the drought will get um, less frequent and less severe uh, because of increased precipitation. The, I mean, but the, that sounds like regional weather patterns. That doesn't sound like <laughs> long-term climate change. That, that's, I mean, if it's regional, then it's not global by definition. So I don't, uh, it's. This is all making way too much sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and that's the problem. When you start talking about sensible things with people like Dr. Mann, he starts screaming abuse. I mean, yeah. literally, the guy has a, you know, we talked about that meteorologist that didn't have the thick skin about people, you know, sending him, stop talking about this because that has nothing to do with weather. Well, Mann's even worse. I mean, he, he is famous for blocking hundreds and hundreds of people on Twitter simply because they might write something that disagree with him. And he takes a lot of this stuff you know, and, and uh, he amplifies it. He turns it into things that are, you know, oh, woe is me. I'm being abused. I'm getting death threats and so forth. Well, who has it who's been in the public sphere? As Linnea properly pointed out earlier, you know, if you're going to be in this, you're going to get that kind of stuff. But man can't handle it. He simply has to elevate it to the point of woe is me. You know, I'm being threatened. I'm being abused and so forth and so on. And yet he is one of the worst abusers himself. He, if you watch his Twitter feed, I mean, I've been called all kinds of things by him. I've been called a ca climate carnival barker. I've been called a shill of the Koch brothers by a Dr. Mann. I've been called, you know, climate denier extraordinaire and all kinds of other things. And he dishes out just as much as he takes in, or even more, as far as I'm concerned. I, uh, here, go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I was going to be like, definitely more. That, that was only... My take on it. I mean, most people don't take like frequent legal action for this kind of thing. Uh, he, he, my understanding is he does. So that's, that's, that's more the more extreme end of it. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, we've got this, um, uh, Judith Curry is a, is a frequent uh, target of his uh, wrath, so to speak. Dr. Judith Curry, who's one of the most mild mannered scientists you could ever ask for, who is all about fact, who's all about, you know, what does the data show? What does reality show? She gets all kinds of abuse from him. And, um, you know, he, he he's just all over her on Twitter recently. And it's mainly because he views her, in my opinion, as being, um, you know, she left the club. She left the club of climate change believers. And she did it of her own volition based on her own uh, examination of the data. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, I know we have the clip of her. I'm trying to pull it up right now. Um, having a minor audio issue there, so give me a moment. But uh, yeah, I mean, he he's. He, I, I want to get this clip up, so for, but he he has made a career on on making outlandish claims that can't be backed up or are backed up by you know faulty data, and then anyone who criticizes him, kind of coming at them like. Oh, these are like ad hominem attacks. What are you doing? And then, while at the same time doing his absolute best to bury people on completely non scientific like re rationale, uh, right. a aka ad hominem attacks. Um, it's pretty odd. It, like, we, I 
I, I joke about them, but it's pretty gross stuff when push comes to shove. But uh, let me get this clip here one sec. It is gross, and it's especially gross because he seems, like Anthony uh, suggested with Dr. Curry, he seems to have a particular animus towards scientists who are very um, moderate in general, who normally don't fight back. You know, they're not normally getting in the mud and stuff. Um, and they have, you know, they, they tend to be kind of more on the lukewarm side or on the, uh, we think that there might, there probably is an anthropogenic component. Um, it may be significant. It may not be significant, but we're not really sure because the signals aren't very clear. We don't think the modeling is very good. And Dr. Mann will absolutely lose his mind over that kind of stuff. Dr. <laughs> Ryan Maui, uh, if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, uh, he's been a frequent uh, target of Dr. Mann on Twitter recently. Um, and, and it's it's gone so far that, you know, tweets of Maui, who was not going after man at the time, were getting like mass reported and stuff. And if you commented on those tweets in support of Dr. Maui, your tweets got mass reported as like spam or as mm -hmm. hateful mm -hmm. content or something. And so it's it's completely <laughs> outrageous that he goes after people like that. And then what he basically what he does is he spins them up into fighting back or getting snippy back. And then he tries to kind of get them. It appears he tries to get them to engage in something that he can call liable or something so that he right. can try to go after them legally um, and shut them yeah. up that way. And I, yeah. it's, it's pretty transparent or at least it appears to be the case that that's the kind of con stuff that he does. Um, and, and there's no room for that in a legitimate scientific debate. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and he doesn't even realize, I think a lot of times that he's even doing it. I mean, he's just, he's so focused on the belief that he's out to save the world from climate change. And, you know, he's got uh, Steve McIntyre on his blog, um, climate audit once said that, uh, People like this have a Jor-El syndrome, you know, Superman, you know, send your son off to the planet that's burning up, you know, or send your son off to Earth. But they say that McIntyre said that people like this have a Jor-El type complex. But yeah. I want to I want to go to Mark Stein. Now, Mark Stein spoke at our ICC 10 in Washington a few years ago, and he summed up what's going on here very succinctly in the way that he described Dr. Mann and his uh, dishing it out, so to speak. Let's watch the clip. And they both said that they don't think the term denier is useful. Who uses the term denier more than anybody else? Uh, Dr. Mann has called just about everyone here deniers. I'm just cruising his Twitter, fair, Twitter feed here. <laughs> Climate denier Joe Bast. Climate change denier John Coleman. Climate change denier Roy Spencer. Anthony Watts, climate nice. change denier extremist. <laughs> <laughs> you win, Anthony. <laughs> yes, I win. I win. I win. You know, so, there used to be a oh, thing yeah, on, on. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it, like I said, he doesn't even realize he's doing this some of the time. But we have another clip of Dr. Mann with Dr. Judith Curry going before Congress doing testimony. And in this clip, he talks about, well, I never called anybody deniers. <laughs> You've got to watch this. This is hilarious. Uh, statements that have been attributed, quiet, to, attributed to me um, that are not correct. I don't believe I called anybody here a denier, and yet that's been stated over and over again. So I've been misrepresented quite a bit today um, by uh, several it's people. It's in your written testimony. Go <laughs> read it again. Boom! That's great. <laughs> it's in your written testimony! <laughs> I mean, like, how, how else can you get a gotcha moment better than that? <laughs> That's good. I, I really struggle to imagine that he, that he would lie about that and be conscious of the fact that that was not the case. I, I, he has to not even realize. He must, like, yeah. his brain must just switch depending on the situation. And anything that he thought before that was inconvenient is no longer in his brain. It's just gone. <laughs> That's a very inconvenient reality. That's <laughs> maybe the most charitable <laughs> interpretation that I can give to his activity. Uh, it, on that you know, panel. it makes it sound less malicious and more 
you know, I don't want to say what I was going to say aloud if, he, if he's known for going after people. So I'm just going to cut my words there. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I mean, I actually, I agree with you. Uh, I, I'm not going to get too far into speculating on that, but I, I think that you actually have a point there because that was embarrassing. It was both embarrassing. It, it went semi-viral at like the time and it's a known moment for exposing uh, who he is and, and what he does as a quasi scientist and and yeah i i don't believe someone would do that knowingly like i i do i do think that he actually in that moment like believed what he was saying and then you know i don't know how it goes from there but um, talk about deniers huh yeah seriously <laughs> uh so here we go yeah, yeah so you know part. dr man is famous for his hockey stick you know that is that is his primary thing it came out uh, you know, around 1998 or so. And the hockey stick, as you see on the bottom there, 1999, Michael Mann, he shows the warming. And what's interesting about this is, is that the graphic at the top is from the 1990 IPCC report, the AR1. Mm -hmm. And as you can see there, they plotted temperature and the medieval warm period was prominent in the same time period. But when Dr. Mann got through with his special sauce of statistical operations, that disappeared. The medieval warm period disappeared. And the only thing that happened was since, you know, the Industrial Revolution, a massive warming. And, of course, mm -hmm. Steve McIntyre and other people went into this and they discovered that this whole thing was based on a statistical um, machination, so to speak. If you and, and Steve McIntyre was able to show you could throw red noise as a signal into this into this algorithm that Dr. Mann had created to make this hockey stick, and it would still come out a hockey stick. It pretty much it just was a hockey stick generator, and so he's suppressing other data in favor of others, and that's the whole problem. And he's yet he's never admitted to this, and he keeps publishing papers saying, "Well, I'm right, I'm right," you know, and it's peer reviewed, therefore I'm right. But, you know, the bottom line is, is that there was, in fact, a medieval warm period. There was, in fact, a Roman warm period. Yeah. There have been, in fact, warmer periods in the past and in the present. But their whole argument about fossil fuels relies on the fact that if we don't simply make the present a crisis compared to the past, we don't have an argument. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite little tidbits to say with regard to the medieval warming period is people often talk about, like, Greenland being a very icy uh nation and then but being called greenland and then like iceland actually being a lot more green but what's what's interesting in my understanding of the the matter is that like when um uh greenland was first colonized um it was during the medieval warming period because you can actually find like notebooks of the people that uh, originally went there at the time and they'll talk about how there wasn't all this snow everywhere and how it was actually like a, a somewhat lush like place at the time and so i mean you know they, they colonized there and like named it Greenland because it actually made sense. Since then, if we look at the um, actual non-Michael Mann uh, chart here, we can see the temperatures have lowered and Greenland has changed. It's, it is now like a, like not green. I'm just have such a great control of the English language, but um, um, so essentially like it's this perfect representation using like historical evidence that the, the medieval warring period was a real moment in history. It, uh, it wasn't this fake, like they like to say that it wasn't uh, actually didn't exist or it was very localized, but no, it was a thing. It's the reason Greenland isn't, you know, an Iceland or whatever. And yeah, that's, that's it. That's my tidbit. Yeah. And, you know, human history shows that humans as a species have done much better during warmer periods than they have during colder periods. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about the dark ages, you know, well, back then it was cold, it was wet, crops were failing and so forth and so on. And then we get into medieval warm period and we go through the Renaissance, we go, you know, exploring science and fantastic art and music. So, you know, warmer is better, at least in terms of human history. Now, so why are we fighting it so much? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, I missed what you said. Why are we fighting like the existence of the medieval warming period? I, I... No, why, why, do, why would we fight warming in the first place when warming oh, yeah. is, is more conducive to human flourishing than cooling is? And that's a good point, Anthony, because, you know, you don't even need the proxy data, um, to, you know, you can, you can look at the historical records of the kind that Andy was talking about. Um, maybe like the, uh, 
the medieval domesday census book where they went around asking farmers, you know, how was your, you know, how many kids do you have? How's your crops doing this year? That kind of thing. And they marked off a bunch of areas that uh, entire towns were dying of famine during some of the cooler periods. Uh, they, you know, you talk about the Irish potato famine. That wasn't mm -hmm. during a warm period. <laughs> that was during a time that was much colder than now. Right. Uh, you talk about, I don't know, um, many, many smaller civilizations, many small towns and stuff that were decimated by famine, by getting frozen out and trapped in valleys during that time period. It's not fun to live in a cold world. It's not good at all. It doesn't serve us well um, in places in the United States even because we have, you know, a big country. So we have a lot of different climate regions here. Um, most of the country, you can get one cycle of crops out of the ground. Uh, in the warmer parts of the country, like where I am now in South Carolina, you can get two seasons of major crops out of your uh, garden because right. they, you have that longer warm period during the year. So it's the idea that warmer is going to be catastrophic uh, is just not backed up by evidence historically. Right. And, you know... Um, people go to, on vacations to warmer places. I mean, that's what people do a lot of times in the winter. I'm tired of the cold and the snow and the wet and everything. And they'll take off from, you know, Manitoba and go to Miami or wherever, you know, or Hawaii. People go to warmer places for a reason. It feels yeah. good, right? Well, I and mean, even yeah. better, even better than that, like what uh, Doug Pollock just said in the comments, there is no such thing as an optimal planetary temperature. Mm -hmm. Everything is relative to the region. Everything is going to be relative to what you're trying to do where you are. Um, yeah, no, there, there's no like average temperature that they can cite that is the ideal temperature, just like there's no average carbon dioxide concentration that is the ideal carbon dioxide concentration. We just don't know. Yeah. Well, and anything above the, the concentration at which plants die is optimal. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, it's like if someone, if one of these guys was doing a congressional hearing and, and a congressman just asked like, so what's the correct temperature? It would be interesting to, to see what they respond with in that yeah. scenario. Yeah, no one has an answer for that. You know, they can cite that what they believe to be the average temperature of the earth uh, and they can cite what they believe that the temperature is now. But see, the thing is, is that way back in the beginning, someone put forth the idea that global warming is bad. And, you know, and it's going to go into runaway mode. And I started talking about Venus. Carl Sagan started talking about this before they really had any good evidence. They started talking about if we get too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're going to go into runaway uh, global warming like Venus has. Well, it's not even possible. We don't have the partial pressure here in the atmosphere for that to even happen. We can't even get close. Just like Earth is not going to turn into a gas giant like Jupiter because of carbon dioxide. It's impossible. And yet... <laughs> Yet people believe this stuff, people that don't have an understanding of math, physics, and science, even on a basic level, just eat this stuff up. It's just like watching the front page of the National Enquirer or some other tabloid. You know, the bat boy is uh, invading New York City, you know, it must be climate change. This is the kind of stuff they believe. Uh, I, I, I have to fight this stuff back on a regular basis. One of the worst ones out there is chemtrails. You know, they think, oh, chemtrails, we're being geoengineered and so forth. Well, baloney. But yeah. I will say this. We are geoengineering the earth on a local level. You know, we do it through the way that we build cities. We do it through the way that we, you know, provide infrastructure and so forth. We are geoengineering the earth for our comfort. And that's been going on for quite some time. Yeah, I, I, I've said this before back when I used to be more regular on this show, but like it's not man and nature and kumbaya singing as, as we figure out how to fight. I don't know, some third day. It's, it's like like life is is learning how to survive the habitat around you, not control it. Um, and recently it's just we've seems to have switched this mindset of like, oh, no, we we run nature like we, we control. It. Like, no, we we survive it. We build the first thing you do if you're out in the wild is you build a house to make sure you're not exposed to the elements. You get electricity, you you adjust the heat inside of your home. Like you it's just that's that's what all of, of human existence has been. And it's only like a recent development that suddenly we we control it. 
Right. So let's go to our last topic, the Texas heat wave. You know, yes. there's been a lot of talk about the heat wave in Texas as being unprecedented. Well, you know, there's an article that was in the Washington Post this week where they talked about five different maps that prove it's climate change. Well, these are weather maps, weather today, and, and they confuse the, the time period of weather and climate. Climate is something that happens over a 30-year period, thirty year period. Weather is something that happens today or this week. And so they completely miss that fact. But more importantly, they miss bigger heat waves that happen. Um, you know, there was a massive heat wave that happened in 1980 that affected Texas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had periods of uh, uh, time where temperatures were over 100 degrees, much more so than the current heat wave. And this, again, is before climate change became an issue in 1980. And then there was July 1936 heat wave. And that thing what, didn't even affect Texas. Texas was actually below normal, but it affected the upper Midwest, the central and upper Midwest, where they had searing temperatures and it killed 5,000 people. Yeah, it says here the most, uh, you wrote here, I think, the most intense heat wave in American history. Wow. Right. And so we've got, you know, the Washington Post getting the opinion of a local TV meteorologist saying that, well, it, none of this could happen in Texas right now without climate change. Well, look at this. This is a map from a couple of days ago from weather.gov. And you can see very clearly the heat wave in Texas. It's regional. It's not global. It's regional. But at the same time, up to the northwest in southern Oregon, northern California, Nevada, and parts of Idaho, they've got frost and freeze warnings going on. Mm -hmm. The dichotomy here is really pronounced. So what is climate change causing? Is it causing both of those things? Is it causing one of those things? Is it causing none of those things? Well, it's causing none of those things. These are standard weather events. And Linnea said something the other day in an article that she wrote that um, weather is uh, eternally fickle. But well, that is absolutely right. Now, we've only got 150 years of good weather data, so we don't know what Mother Nature can still throw at us yet. Yeah. Right. And, and one of the most obnoxious things about this area, the, especially the climate alarm uh, side of it, is the attribution science side. And I think I threw in our show notes a link to an article that I did on um, some of the attribution stuff that's come uh, out lately. I, maybe people who have a better grasp of how the modeling works at a deeper level than I do can explain this to me. But I don't understand how it's good science to start with the assumption that a weather event is worse because of climate change. And then you kind of create a model that is a fantasy, basically a fantasy of what you imagine the climate would be like if human beings didn't exist. And then you compare it to the data from a storm and then you see the difference and you say, this is how much was caused by human beings of this storm. Or this is why the storm is 15% more intense because of climate change caused by human beings. I, I don't I don't understand how anyone can rationalize that that's good science mm -hmm. to themselves. I understand why the media believes it, because they don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> because <laughs> and they don't care to learn. I understand why the media hypes that stuff. I don't understand how people can legitimately believe themselves to be scientists and happily produce uh, these projects, these attribution projects, you know, to two days after a storm happens and say, we have conclusively found that this storm is, would have been impossible or virtually impossible is the term they usually use if there was no human caused climate change. How, but you started on the assumption that it was caused by human caused climate change. So how is that scientific? How is that not just you building a model to confirm what you already believe and then presenting it as if you discovered something. Well, I, that's a mic drop moment right there. <laughs> it really is. Um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's, I have no solid response to that. It's a good point. <laughs> yeah. What can you say? What can you say? All right. We're, uh, we're about five minutes to the top of the hour. We've got time for questions. Some of you folks have asked questions uh, during this period. Can I quickly, I asked uh, our commenters earlier in this episode who could make the best, uh, wordplay involving the you know man 
Uh, let me just throw okay. a couple on screen. Let's, let's, see, just... let's see what that is. All right, so we've got uh, he really mangle, mangles the dad. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this one. Oh was my, that's good. Uh, so guys, you guys have left so many comments, and I haven't had a great chance to monitor it. So I apologize if I miss a few of yours here. I'm just gonna play a couple of them. But this man really is a maniac. <laughs> I don't know. These are pretty good. Uh, let me let me get a couple more. There was some some good ones by Donald Kendall in here. Uh, here we go. On his magnificent theories that he managed to manhandle his clowns. God, <laughs> just name after name. All right, one more, one more. Uh, let's see. Oh, the, the classic man-made climate change. All right, I'll, yeah, I'll stop. All of it, goody. Yeah, there's some good ones in here. Uh, all right, so yeah, let me find some questions. My here. favorite one is, yeah. is uh, channeling Carl Sagan. Mantastic claims require mantastic evidence that's pretty good <laughs> that's not bad i haven't heard that one uh all right so let me see what uh questions did i did i try to save um so we got this one by peter gill why talk about the people rather than what they say i think that's about the ad hominem attacks uh i don't know do one of you want to reference that well i would I mean, I would ask the same. If if this is directed at us, why are we talking about Michael Mann instead of uh, just? I think it, so I remember thing. when this was asked, it was just kind of like it was in reference to to why um it, it, like like why would they they attack like scientists on our side? I believe like why not argue for the same? Never, well, you, you got I, it. on on our side, the constant blame game out there is we are shells of big oil. You know, we're paid to have an opinion, you know, that we didn't come to these conclusions of our own volition, you know, that, you know, we're, we're uh, paid by the Koch brothers. I mean, all these claims about how us, how, how we as individuals yeah. come to our conclusion because we're paid to do so. And I want to say right away, that's not true. I've never taken a dime from big oil. And Harlan Institute hasn't had any funding from Exxon for gosh, almost two decades now. And so we're not in that mode. And despite what they say, we are not being driven by big oil in any way, shape, or form. We're driven by what we believe is truth. We go look at the data. We go look at what the data says. And then we use that to counter some of the outrageous arguments that we've seen you know, about wildfires and so forth and so on. And for that, we're called climate change deniers. Well, and, and that, that, Anthony, but also, you know, if you're getting these kinds of ad hom attacks launched at us, I don't think it's entirely inappropriate to point out their funding or their, you know, poor character. Oh, yeah. And no, so seriously. I don't, I don't think that it's inappropriate to fight back. So if, if the objection is to um, our show kind of teasing and making, poking some fun at uh, Dr. Mann, uh, I would say I think it's it's an appropriate response to the kind of con um, conduct that that he engages in all the time. Um, so I <laughs> I just read yeah. another one of Doug's comments. Tim Ball <laughs> said Michael Mann should be in the in the state pen <laughs> instead of in Penn State. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. That's, That's a good one. Good. Uh, uh, yeah, and you know, this is an old saying that goes way back to, you know, even before Michael Mann got involved, they said this up at Penn State, or people said this about Penn State, long, long time ago, but Mann took umbrage to this and decided to sue um, Tim Ball, Dr. Tim Ball in Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people were rising that. You know, Mann lost, he lost because he drug his feet, he didn't want to go through proper, you know, discovery and so forth and so on, and the judge finally ruled for Dr. Ball. Uh, Dr. Ball died without ever getting one cent of the money that he was ordered to be paid by Dr. Mann. If I mean, yeah, that's that's where I say, you know, the guys, the guys, gross. Uh, all right, so actually, I do have some uh, some good questions here. Let me pull some of these up. Um, is Mann still refusing to supply his data to the Canadian courts? Well, I just answered that question. That that is well. There's there's two things going on. There was the Tim Ball lawsuit, and that's over with. That's done. And yes, man didn't go through discovery. Okay. But we've also got the one with Mark Stein, commentator Mark Stein, who used to fill in for Rush Limbaugh, and who you saw earlier in this show speaking about uh, all the different people Dr. Mann is labeled as climate change deniers. Um, he has a lawsuit from Dr. Mann associated with this whole thing. And Dr. Mann has been dragging this thing out in the Washington, D.C. court for a decade now. 
And that's the whole thing. With Dr. Mann, the process is the punishment. He's not really interested, in, as far as I can tell, to find a resolution to anything. He just wants to keep bogging you down with legal fees, legal hassle, and so forth. Yeah. Um, I just want to put up the super chat from Christine. Uh, what can we do besides repeating the facts we learned from the show to anyone who will listen? Maybe we need t-shirts with climate X. First off, thank you for the super chat, Christine. Usually this is your job, Linnea. So I apologize for jumping in and pointing out the super, yeah, the, the super chat. Um, that, that's a, that, I mean, that's a tough one. Like it's, it's, it, what I like to say is that intellectually we've won the argument uh, from, but from a public perspective, we're still working on it. Um, generally speaking, my opinion on this matter is the most important thing I can do on an individual level is just uh, try to change people's minds. Because like I, one person could end up being the voice that changes, you know, 10 people who like it, it, everything starts at an individual level and then grows. And, and whether or not like what we do is the catalyst for like ultimate change, I, you can never speak to. But it does matter, like every single person that you that you cause to look at something differently. Uh, that's just kind of how I, I've always looked at it. And not every and not every strategy is going to work for every person, right? That that's the same for any mm -hmm. any topic at all that you're trying to convince people of your side on. Um, there are some people who are going to be really impressed with you um, spamming links to data at them, uh, and there are some people who will ignore it because they're like, "Well, I don't trust your sources, no matter what the sources are." So. Um, those people might need, you know, to be walked down the logical path rather than purely data. And other people will respond a lot better to the emotional side. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of the emotional arguments, look at yeah. the results of climate policy. I think that's a very powerful one. Um, you yeah. don't have to, you know, go up to someone and say, you know, hey, wildfires actually aren't getting worse after their house was just burned down in a wildfire. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. might not be a helpful strategy, um, but you can say, you know, how do we stop this from happening? And if their yeah. response is you have to stop using fossil fuels, then you can talk about why that's going to be bad for people, why other people will mm -hmm. lose their homes because of that or whatever it happens to be. Um, or and you can say instead, how about we work on better forest management? We can make sure that this doesn't happen to people as often, you know, because you're never going to stop it entirely unless you have like the firmest iron grip and the fastest response time to every spark that flares up in the middle of the woods. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's totally going to depend on the situation. You're just going to have to feel it out as best as you can as, you know, a lay person or as, as an individual that's just talking to friends and family. Yeah, I, I think that's a solid point. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of people in the comments are writing like the response that they'll get sometime is like, oh, I don't trust your data, which is another tough one. Um, I can say that when I've done these debates, it's like I'll try to pick a subject that I know my data is like from the IPCC or something like that. So I'll, I'll try to to not take the debate in their playing field. Like I don't want to debate like I'm still going to debate something that's actually reasonable versus consensus or something like that. But, but I'll try to at least know what subjects uh, I can pull from sources they'll find acceptable uh, without negating their own arguments. And then I'll, I'll focus in on those. And an example would be like hurricanes. A lot of the hurricane data that we've cited in the past on the show will be like the IPCC even says there's low confidence that like uh, temperatures are leading to an increase in like a hurricane. You get what I'm going at here, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll focus on those particular topics. Um, yeah, use the you know using the government source data as much as you can is good. Um, you know, sometimes in terms of the wildfire thing, some people will not find our historic wildfire data argument compelling because the National Fire Service removed it, and they'll say, "Well, they're the experts; they had a reason for removing it." And you can go in and you can go down the rabbit hole of debating why it wasn't appropriate for them to move it or yeah. remove it, and why did it take them until Biden came into office before they decided that the historic data wasn't appropriate anymore? Why did they pick the date that they did? You could do that, um, but it might be kind of talking in circles a bit more. But what you can do is you can pull the global data for recent years. Yeah. And that will be helpful. Yeah, that's a solid point. Um, I can see that 
we're at about time here. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm not sure how much more of this I can manage. <laughs> <laughs> I just I had to get one out as the winner. I thought that one was pretty good. All right. It is pretty good. And with that, I think it's time to wrap up this edition of Climate Change Roundtable number 68. I want to thank everybody for managing to join us <laughs> and for managing to listen to us anyway. Uh, all of the man, man stuff aside, thanks for joining us. Uh, for Andy and Linnea, I want to remind you to visit us at uh, climate, uh, climaterealism.com, climateataglance.com, and energyataglance.com for some of the latest stuff. All right. Have a good weekend, everybody. I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate for the Heartland Institute, wishing you a great weekend and a good day. <laughs>